verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? And they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The title of our morning's message is Go and Sin No More. Let's open in prayer and ask the Lord to bless. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, there's, there's so much in your word, Lord God. We will never exhaust it, I believe, in this lifetime. But Lord, the little that you give us this morning, I pray we can take it to heart. And help us learn from this story. Help us learn from this woman. And help us learn from you, O Lord God. That we may lay it all on the altar. May we lay it all on the throne and look to you, Lord God, for help and for strength. For you are the source of our eternal life, the source of our life, Lord God, the source of all things. Bless the service now, Lord God, and meet all the needs. I pray the Holy Spirit may touch the hearts of the people here. And you, you're the greatest comforter, Father, we have. And I pray you help us now. And all that is said and done may be done for your honor and for your glory. That you may be lifted up. That your people may see you and no one else. And not me, Father. We thank you, for, Lord, and we pray for the presence, for the liberty of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Would you come and meet with us, Lord God. And tell us that we are your own. And Christ is our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now the passage we just read is a very familiar passage to most Christians. Many of us have heard this story either through a previous message or through a Sunday school lesson. And I believe it's popular because it resonates with many of us who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. In this passage we have four things going on. First we have the religious accusers. Then we have the adulterous woman. We have the compassionate Christ. And then we have the divine warning. So we have these men, and they brought this woman in the midst of Christ for only one purpose. The sole purpose was to tempt Christ. They were not interested in fulfilling the law. In fact, they bragged and they said, we caught her. We caught her in the very act. And notice who these people were. They were the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, do you know who the scribes were? They were a group of people at that day, in that day and age, who were educated. They knew how to read. They knew how to write. Keep in mind, back in the day, they didn't have public school. They didn't have all the resources that we have today. And many people were illiterate. They grew up illiterate. But there were a select few that had the opportunity to be, to, to be educated. And these are the scribes. If you wanted a contract written, you went to a scribe. If you wanted to sell something and have an agreement between the buyer and the seller, it was a scribe who wrote it up. If you want something read and you couldn't read it, you went to a scribe. You say, hey, Mr. Scribe. How much to read this for me? And it was just a normal part of business in the day. They were educated. They knew how to read and write. And then we have another group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a Jewish sect that was started in the 2nd century BC. And they had devoted themselves to keeping every jot and tittle of the law. They had made a vow that they would keep the entire law of Moses. But uh, they also believed another thing that's not found in the Bible. They believed that God also told Moses how to interpret these laws. And they thought and they believed they had how they should carry out these laws and they had oral tradition that was passed on from generation to generation. They codified this oral tradition called the Talmud. These were extra biblical things that they added to the law. And Christ rebuked them for doing that. He said, you guys add a lot of things to the law, things that men cannot bear. So these two groups along with the Sadducees were Jesus Christ's main opposition. 
They tried repeatedly to trip him up, to catch him at his words. Have you ever met someone that you have a conversation with, that they're listening to you, but they know they're not listening to you? They're only listening to trip you up, to trap you, to say, I got him. I don't like talking to those kind of people because you've got to be guarded all the time. They're listening to catch a word that you may say something wrong. We're all human. We're all going to say something wrong. We're all going to slip up. But they wanted to trap Christ. But the irony is you can't trap a man who's perfect. You can't trap a man who knows what you're thinking before you're even going to think it. That's what they hadn't realized. They were staring at the face of God himself. So these men caught a woman in adultery. Now I suspect they didn't actually catch this woman. I believe it was a setup. And I'll tell you why in a moment, why I believe it was a setup. You see, if you study the Old Testament law, there was punishment for adultery. Adultery is when you have relations with someone who is not your spouse. And Leviticus 20.10 says this regarding adultery. And the man and the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now that's pretty serious. Now if you would apply the Old Testament <coughs> law today, that would mean that 21% of men and 15% of women would have to be put to death. That's what the infidelity statistics tell us. The data suggests that 21% of men have been unfaithful to their spouse or significant other. The data also says that women cheat less. Only 15% acknowledge that they've had a relationship with someone other than their uh, spouse or significant other. Now some may breathe a sigh of relief and say, I've never committed adultery. Uh, I don't have to worry about this sin. But don't, don't, don't get too uh, comfortable here. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, the Bible says that whosoever, that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now how many of us would be guilty of that? How many of us would be guilty as charged? How many of us would fall under this condemnation? If the law in the Old Testament included not only what you actually did, but what you actually thought, would you be guilty of this law in Leviticus chapter, what we just read, chapter 20 verse 10? How many of us would be guilty of this sin, of this law, if we now apply the New Testament rules to adultery? When Jesus came, he made known to us that God not only looks at the actions, but he also looks at what's inside your heart. Murder, the Bible says, is not only an action, but also a feeling, a thought. The Bible says if you hate your brother, it's as if you killed him. It's as if you have murdered him. God said this. And what is sad about the infidelity statistics, if they asked this question, they said, if you could cheat and no one would find out, what would you do? 74% of men said they would do it. And 68% of women said they would green light an affair if there was no chance of the current partner finding out. What a sad state our society is in. That's right. What a sad state of affairs. The people would be willing to cheat on their spouse given the opportunity. But the scribes and the Pharisees were not interested in fulfilling the law. They knew what the law said. The law says both the man and the woman be need to be put to death. But I want to ask you, based on the story we just read from the scriptures, where was the man? Where was he? These were religious men. They said, we caught her in the act. They knew the law. They were Pharisees. In fact, to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Some of us can't even memorize a couple of verses, let alone the first five books of the Bible. But that was a requirement to be a Pharisee. So I could just picture the scene here. They dragged this woman out of bed, and they dragged her to Jesus, and let's see what this guy's going to do with her. We caught her. But they left the man behind. Why? I believe he's one of them. I believe it was a setup. I believe one guy volunteered and said, I'm going to do this, and we're going to see what this guy, Jesus, does with the situation. They wanted to see if this guy called Jesus, who ate with the tax collectors, and hung out with the prostitutes, and the ritually impure, they wanted to see if he would be tough on sin. So they picked a clear-cut scenario, a clear-cut consequence, a, Bible, a biblical slam dunk. So they thought... And then they passed around the stones. The Bible tells us that each man had a stone in his hand. And then when they were convicted of their sin, they dropped the stone and left. But the Bible tells us Jesus did something strange. As they brought this woman, he stooped down and began writing. 
And after a while, he looks at the crowd, after he begins writing for a while, and he says, He that is without sin, let him first cast the stone at her. And then he stoops down again and continues writing with his finger scribbling in the sand. Many have wondered what Jesus wrote in the sand. I wish I knew too. The Bible does not tell us what he wrote, just the fact that he wrote. What did he write? Names, lists of sins, something about that God desires mercy over sacrifice, or maybe the man's name that was left behind. Whatever it was, whatever he wrote, it was enough to convict them of their sin. I have always wondered if he perhaps listed all their secret sins that they've committed that, were, that they would have been guilty under the Old Testament law. God knows all the intents and thoughts of our hearts, the Bible says. Someone said the difference between us and those in prison is that they have been caught and we haven't. If you go back to your past life and all the sins that you've committed, all the things that you've done from a child all the way to adulthood, if you were an honest person, say, yes, there are some things in there that I have done in my life that had the law caught me, my person would have been in, in the slammer. But whatever the finger of God wrote that day, it was enough to convict them of their sin. What would the finger of God write about you? If Christ were here right now and he would start writing in the carpet, what would he, what would he write about me and you? There are several other times you find in the Bible that the finger of God wrote some things. Once in Deuteronomy and again in the book of Daniel. I want you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 5 while I read to you Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 10. Daniel chapter 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 9 10 the Bible tells us this. And the Lord delivered, this is Moses speaking, and he says, The Lord delivered unto me the tables, two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. The Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God. God actually, if you read the account, God actually carved two ta tablets from the mountain and he smoothed them out. And then he begins writing with his hands and with his finger engraving the law on those stones. Only God could do such a thing. The second time we see the finger of God is found in Daniel chapter 5. I want to begin reading a few verses. And this is the uh, King Belshazzar made a great feast with thousands of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. It wasn't the drinking wine that got God. It was this in verse 2. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. And as they were doing this, look what verse 5 says. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against a candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loose. I love how the King James words it here. We'll find out why that's so important. And his knees smote one against another. So when this pagan, drunken pagan king was drinking from the cups of the Lord's temple, that was a line in the sand that God had drawn. God says, that's enough. I'm not going to tolerate what this king is doing. Sacri uh, committing sacrilege against my holy vessels. And then out of nowhere a hand appears. Imagine this. We're all here t now this morning. And the hand appears out of nowhere, a big hand. And the hand starts scribing and scribing on the, on, the, on, the, on the drywall over here. He'd be scared if he, if he thought about it. And that's what happened to this king. As he saw this hand appear of Noor and he starts writing on the wall, he got really, really scared. Have you ever thought what the joints of the loins were loose means? The loins are the sides of your ribs, right, the sides, right, sides of your body right underneath your ribs. So when the joints refer to the stuff that's inside your intestines over here, part of your body. So when the Bible says the joints were loosed, he either soiled himself or peed on himself. 
That's what the joints of his loins were loosed means. They have changed it in some of the modern versions. That's what it means. This king saw this hand. Remember, he was also drunken. If you've ever dealt with drunks, one of the things that they do in their drunken stupor, they let loose on themselves. And that's what happened to this king. He saw this hand in his drunken stupor, got so scared that the Bible says the joints of his loins were loosed. And then his knees began to smote up against another. Have you ever seen the cartoons where the other characters underneath do a tinkle, a tinkle between each other? And that's what happened to this king. That's how scared he was. Well, Hebrews 10.31 tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You hear many tough guys say, I'm going to put the fear of God into you. How many of you guys have heard the tough guys say that? You heard that? They have no idea. You've heard that. I've heard that too. I mean, the kind of guys I grew up with, right? They have no idea what the fear of God is. When God wants to scare you, He can scare you. So King Belshazzar was mocking God that day, and God would have none of it. And God says, I'm going to scare the bejesus out of this guy. And God pronounced judgment on him. And Hebrews 10, remember, tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if you are a Christian here this morning, that is so important. The topic of our message here is go and sin no more. I do not want to fall into the hands of the living God and have him correct me and tell me that I'm doing something wrong. And what did the finger of God write in the king's palace? No one could decipher it. They brought the astrologers, the soothsayers, the magicians, and all the prognosticators. But then they said, there's this man called Daniel. He could interpret the writing. And they brought Daniel, and Daniel said, this is what the writing says, meaning that means God hath numbered thy kingdom and it is finished. This word meaning was spoken twice, was written twice on the wall. Then the second, third word was tekel. It means, king, you have been weighed and found wanting. You have been weighed in the balances of heaven and you have been found wanting. And lastly, the hand said, the hand wrote Perez, which means the kingdom is, is divided and has been given over to the Medes and the Persians. God pronounced judgment and didn't even, even give the king a chance to think about it. For that very night, the Bible tells us he was killed by the Medes and the Persians. And now this king, Belshazzar, is suffering in the flames of fire and hell, wishing he could have went back. Now, why was God so hard on this king? Remember who his grandfather was. His grandfather was Nebuchadnezzar. God called Nebuchadnezzar that he was my servant. Nebuchadnezzar had a revelation from the king of heaven. And Nebuchadnezzar turned his ways around and acknowledged the king of heaven, the God most high. And even pronounced in his own kingdom that all should worship the God of Daniel. That's who this king's grandfather was. He had no excuse. Grandpa had told him about, about the God in heaven. And what does he do? He mocks the God in heaven by bringing the vessels uh, that his grandfather had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. And God says, that's it. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to punish this king. So when Jesus was writing in the sand, it was the finger of God. So we put all these together, and I suppose that whatever God, whatever Christ wrote on that sand, basically he's writing something having to do with the man's sins or having to do with the law. And there are many theories, some say what Jesus wrote on the sand, but I can tell you one thing for certain. No one knows, because <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us. But whatever he wrote, it was enough to convict these men of their sin. And they dropped the stones and they walked away in the guilt of their sin. And that's the sad part of the whole story. He was the man right there who could forgive their sin. But they walked away with the guilt of their sin still on their shoulders. The Bible says in John chapter 8 verse 9, And when they heard it, what did they hear? They heard Jesus said, If you are without sin, cast the first stone. They were Pharisees. They were supposed to be blameless. They should have had no sin upon them, according to the law. They were convicted by their own conscience and went out one by one, beginning at the eldest. Have you ever wondered why the, guy, the, older, the older guy left first? Because he had more sins. <laughs> that was pretty obvious. And then the youngest. And lastly, the Bible says, Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. Religion gave this woman a death sentence. But Jesus Christ gave her a second chance. And when all, were, all the accusers were left, Jesus said unto her, Woman, woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Jesus always upset the religious crowd. 
If you study the, the history of the church, you'll find out the people that persecuted the Christians most were the religious people. I'm here to tell you that Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship with the only Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity is not about rules. It's about freedom from sin. Christianity is not about the money for marriage. It's about mercy from God. God doesn't want your money. He asks you to give, to bless you, because that's how he set it up in the Word. And Christianity is not about tradition, but truth. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees have turned the Jewish religious system into a system of traditions. Do this, do that, and you'll be okay. Don't we know many religions like that today? Yeah. Someone said going to church doesn't make you a Christian just as much as standing in your garage makes you a car. There's a lot of truth to that. You can stand all day long in your garage, but you'll never turn into a car. You can be to church Sunday and Sunday out, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, wherever the church doors are open. But if Christ has not been made your personal Savior, then you're not a Christian. It's simple as that. Jesus gave this woman a second chance, a new beginning. This woman escaped certain death. The Bible never tells us what happened to this woman. We're not given any details or how she lived after this event or whether she went back into the world or whether she followed God to the very end. But I know one thing based on all the other stories that are in the Bible, anyone who had an encounter with Jesus Christ never left the same. And I can tell you that woman had an encounter with Christ that day, and she was never the same. And as she gazed into the eyes of the one who said, neither do I condemn thee, the sigh, the relief that she felt must have been incredible. None of us can really relate to this woman. She was facing the death penalty. There was certain death. These men were ready to stone her. She was going to die that day. But someone stepped in. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. And this woman now is a picture of grace for the Christian today. The woman did nothing of her own power to receive assistance from Jesus. The Bible says she did not say a word. But she knew one thing. She knew that she was guilty. And now she was standing before the one the only one that could extend grace and mercy to her. And as Christians, we ought to hold to this glorious truth, understanding that it is only the Lord Jesus Christ, it is only His mercy and His grace that could help us, that could forgive us. And I'm here to tell you, like the hymn writer said, I, I am only a sinner saved by grace. Amen. To God be the glory. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, we get a little insight of how the devil works. And if you, saw, if, you, if you study the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll find out they are a type of the devil. Because in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible says this, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan's favorite pastime is ratting you up. When the devil goes before God, he go, according to this verse, he goes up and he says, Did you see what John did? Did you see what Sally did? You see where Joe is going? Are you going to let him get away with that? And God, I could imagine, stoops down from his throne and he writes on the ground as though he didn't hear the devil. And what he writes on the ground is, All is forgiven. All is under the blood. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his forgiveness. And one, the devil's lie is to, uh, to keep you from God by telling you God doesn't love you, God doesn't want you. He wants, to wall, he wants you to wallow in your misery and in your sin. But God is telling us, I'll forgive you 70 times 7 in a day. You can commit the same sin. Now, I'm not giving you a license to sin here. Don't get me wrong. Don't go out and do all the sins and say, God forgive me. But the thing is, we as human beings are weak. We will fall. We will commit a sin. But God wants you immediately to go to His throne and restore relationship and fellowship with Him. There's a devil that lies to you and says, God doesn't love you anymore. The Bible says God loved us even before we committed any sins. Before we were even born, Christ loved us. But God commended His love. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can you say this morning, my sins are gone? Can you... Sing along with the hymn writer that says, They're underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from light. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, in the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. It is the devil that brings up your past, not God. 
Because the devil brings up your past. Why? Because he knows if he does it, he'll get you down. God does not want you to be down. When you go to God and say, Lord, remember the sin that I... What sin God's going to say? It's all under the blood. It has all been forgiven. But well, right after the, Jesus says to the woman, neither do I condemn thee, he says one more thing. He says, go and sin no more. And what time we have left, that's what I want to focus on. I want to focus on the statement, this phrase that Jesus said to this woman. Go and sin no more. Jesus is basically saying to this woman, I forgave you. I rebuked your accusers. I sent them packing. I delivered you from certain death. I delivered you from hell. But I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to go and sin no more. And I want to encourage yourself, you got yourselves, as myself. As the new year approaches, we will all about to make new year resolutions come Tuesday. But I want you to think about this and resolve in yourself that in 2019, you're gonna to say to yourself and to God, God, I will go and I will sin no more. Now, before you gasp and get bent out of shape, this is a tall order. But if it was not possible, then why did Christ tell this woman, go and sin no more? He gave her a new start. He gave her freedom from the penalty of sin. He delivered her from her condemnation. The Pharisees and the scribes were after blood. They said, Lord, Master, we caught her in the very act, holding stones in their hands. Can we kill her? If Christ had said yes, the loss is good. She should be stoned. They would have been happy, more than happy, to throw the first stone. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want the punishment for law is there to keep us from sin. The hypocrites are going to accuse us. The devil is going to accuse us before God. But God has given us a new start the moment we receive Christ as our Savior. And as the new year comes around, I want you to resolve in your heart and say, I'm going to make this my New Year's resolution. As many others are about to make New Year's resolution, and we know what most of them are about. I'll tell you what the statistics say in a minute. They say gym membership goes up 12% in January. <laughs> Everybody signs up at the gym. And they say most people don't even go 100 times in the gym. And by five months, 50% are no longer going at the gym. I think I'm going to start a gym and just have a, mirror, a picture of all the weight equipment. And say, okay, in five months, all this equipment's going to come in. Sign up, get your free membership now. Or not free membership, but your reduced mem membership. I'm kidding, I'm not going to do such a thing. But you can probably, <laughs> my wife is shaking her head now, don't do such a thing. But that's what happens. People get all excited January 1st. They all sign up at the gyms. They say, these are the resolutions that I'm going to make. And I want to read you the top 15 that a Nielsen survey in 2015 uh, came up with. The first one is, they want to get in shape. And you say, well, I'm good on that one. Round is a shape, so I'm good on that one. Two, they want to lose weight. They want to enjoy life to the fullest. Spend less, save more. Number five, spend more time with family and friends. Six, get organized. I know my wife's been watching a lot of organization videos. She's been watching them for a long time. So, <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> Seven, learn something new. Eight, travel more. Nine, break the smartphone addiction. Eat at home less, drink less, stop smoking, reduce stress, get more sleep. I, I'm, I need that one. Floss regularly, number 15, floss regularly. Well, all these good goals, as I examine this list, there's one thing I do not find on that list. Nothing about spiritual things. Nothing about going to church regularly. Nothing about reading my Bible more. Nothing about praying more. Nothing about giving to God more. Nothing about giving God more of my time. It's all about how I look. And that's a reflection of our society's appearance, how we look on the outside. Now, don't get me wrong. God does not want us to look disheveled or look like slobs. I was one of those when I was a teenager. I was a slob when I was, when I was a teenager until I heard a message. A preacher preached, well, it's a time for another day. And he, God convicted me, and I changed my ways. I only had two things in my drawer, jogging pants and T-shirts. That's all I wore everywhere. To work, to school, to church, everywhere. It was pretty easy for me. I got dressed in, in 10 seconds. But I want to read you a verse in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Bible says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh at the heart. 
One of the things you'll never find in the Bible is intelligence. I was talking to uh, someone a couple of days ago and I said, God is not looking for your brains. No matter how smart you are, how do you compare with God's IQ? You can't. You can't. But God is looking for your heart. He's looking for a heart that says, God, I will do whatever you ask me to do. In Matthew 6, 16, Christ even tells us that we have to watch our outward appearance when you're about to fast. He says, don't go out with a sad countenance of the Pharisees telling everybody, look, I'm fasting. Look how sad I am. Look how pitiful I look. He says, anoint your face. Don't let people know that you're fasting. Put some stuff on your face. He said, anoint your face with oil. Make sure you look presentable on the outside so that people will not know that you're actually fasting. God's saying, do not look disheveled. God is interested in our outward appearance. But he's more he's also more he's more interested though in what's in our heart. And if you've ever looked at some of the girls who suffer a lot of insecurity, it's always typically the pretty girls that suffer from insecurity. Because they grow up with little girls, oh look how cute she is, oh look how beautiful she is. And then she grows up and then she doesn't get the attention that she was getting when she was a young girl, and then she thinks there's something wrong. It's just the way our society is. God is not interested how long you look on the outside. But what's on in what's going on inside your heart and uh, come January I will try to lose some weight like some of you will could be one of my New Year resolutions New Year's resolutions so I can get my blood pressure under control and all of us are gonna do that but let's resolve in our hearts to do something spiritual for for 2019 mm -hmm. to go and say no more I know I've started on a diet that hopefully will help my blood pressure, and we'll see how, how, how that works. But uh, did you hear about the guy who lost 1,200 calories? He left, he forgot his pizza in the oven. Every time someone says, every time I hear the word exercise, I wash out my mouth with chocolate. I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to exercise come 2019, I'm going to go on a diet, and I'm going to stick with it. Is that cake? Is that cake and ice cream? I'm going to start tomorrow. How many of us have said that? I do that all the time. You start a diet, and here's your wife, and she makes this awesome meal, and you're like, what are you making tonight? <clears throat> I'm going to start my diet tomorrow, I think. Or somebody calls you over and brings all the chocolate and ice cream. I'll start the next. And you know what? It never starts. It never happens. Only 64% of New Year's resolutions last more than the first month. By the first month, 64% of the people are done. And they say 46%. Are done by of those remaining are done by in six months from now but those are all fleeting and I want to encourage you as 2019 comes around I want to encourage you to purpose in your heart tell God that you're gonna try and be a better Christian after all God God commands us go and sin no more now we know that we're saved by grace as Christians you guys all know that that there's nothing you can do to merit salvation not of works not of your own the Bible says but God expects us as Christians to have higher standards than the world out there. God expects us to be careful with what we watch, be careful with what we listen to, to filter what we see, to weigh our words, to try and not offend people. The Bible says offenses will come. But all these things we are to do, not to gain favor with God, but so that we are clean, so we, God can shine through us. Have you ever seen those cars where the people write on the back, wash me? Right? Until you get all that grime and dirt out of that car, you cannot see it, what's underneath all that grime and dirt. And it's like that as a Christian. God wants you to get rid of all the grime and dirt so He can see you and you can see Him. And that's why God says, go and sin no more. This was a divine warning God gave the woman caught in adultery. Go and sin no more. I forgave you. I send your accusers away. I have not condemned you. But go and sin no more. There's another story in John chapter 5 of a similar type of situation where there was a man who was paralyzed for 38 years. He was lame at his feet and Christ appeared unto him and he says, uh, what's up? And I'm paraphrasing the, the scriptures here real quickly. And he says, well, I've been at this pool for the last 38 years and when the angel comes and stirs the water, there is no man to put me in so I can receive healing. And then Jesus Christ looks at the man and says, well, do you want to be healed? God has a sense of humor. Here's this man, 38 years, lame at his feet, cannot walk, and Jesus asks him, do you want to be healed? There's a reason for this, because God does not want to violate our free will. We talk about 
Why does God require this? Why does God require that? He requires a lot of things, but ultimately, He leaves it up to us. God does not want to violate my free will. You had a free will when you became a Christian, and you have a free will to be, continue being a Christian. I'm not talking about eternal security now. You are here this morning, out of what? Who forced you to come here? Except for the kids. We're not talking about the children now. The adults here in our presence. The kids were drugged to church. But the adults, you have free will. You're here out of your own free choice. And that's what God wants. He wants you to serve Him out of your free will. And then Jesus looked at that man and he said, Of course I want to be healed. He says, Rise up and take your bed and walk. Now, imagine if that man would have sat down and he would have said, Am I going to take my, who is this guy telling me to take my bed? And well, I can't walk. But he believed whoever this man was. And by faith, he stood up. And I'm sure he was amazed when he stood up. And that's what Christ expects from us. Yes, we can go and sin no more. But we can only do that through the grace and power of Jesus Christ. And by faith, if you say, Lord, I'm going to try to live a better life. Not to please the pastor or the neighbor or my spouse or my mom or my dad. I want to live a better life so I can please God, the Father, who sent His Son to die on the cross for me. Someone said, we don't do works after we get saved to stay saved or to please God, but as an expression of our gratitude for what God has done for us. And the warning says, go and sin no more because God will not tolerate sin. As his child, if you do not heed to the divine warning, God will come after you. That's a message for another time. But all you who have children, if you tell your child to do A and your child does B, what does that do to you? Does that make you angry? Does that make you upset? God is no different. We are his children and he loves us. And when he says to us, do this, he expects us to do it. He says, you're my child, you belong to me, you represent me. The Bible says, his name is written upon us. And God expects us to do the things that he, we ought to do. A few nights ago, I went out with uh, Officer Mike. I considered it a privilege, and I, we saw some of the people, the less fortunate of our society, not less human, but people gripped by their vices. And, and it, broke, it breaks your heart to see people like that, to see them in the sin that they're involved in. And what makes it even harder as Christians is that you know what the solution is. The solution is Jesus Christ. We uh, were there at a scene where this guy had overdosed and the paramedics were trying to revive him. And after he revived him, they, they have these new drugs now. Amazing, I didn't even know that. They could just revive him in like uh, seconds. And I got a chance to talk to one of the paramedics. And he was telling me that Oh, this guy, probably this guy will be out in about an hour. We take him to the hospital, an hour later they release him, and he ODs again. I said, really? I was shocked to hear that. I never heard this before. He goes, yeah. And then I said, you know what the answer is, though? He was kind of troubled with why these people are gripping their vice. And I said, you know what the answer is? It's Jesus Christ. Well, he goes, I used to go to church, but I, I don't kind of believe that stuff anymore. I said, then why do we celebrate Christmas? He said, I used to go to church, the Catholic church he used to go to. But the, the conversation made me believe that he no longer thinks that stuff is real anymore. But he was still convicted by that conversation because he had some religious upbringing. And I said, you know what the answer is? The answer is Jesus Christ. If these people had Christ, he could deliver them from their vices. That's right. But it's easy for us to look at the people in a lost condition. It's easy for us to look and to say, this guy needs Christ. But you know what is hard? It's hard for us to look at our own sin and say, I need to live a better life. Not to be accepted by God. There is no life that you can live after you get saved that will please God. Because you are accepted in the beloved. You are already pleased. God is already pleased with you because Christ is living inside you. But the thing is, God wants you to live a holy life so that He can do things through you and for you. So that you can experience that relationship, the the glory of God in your heart. And that's why He wants you to live a, a holy life. And, and sometimes I wonder to myself, what, what can motivate Christians to have this desire and the attitude, the Lord, I will go and sin no more. And I think one of the things that you can do as a Christian 
is to realize what God, what sin does to your God. I want you to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 8. We're almost done over here. Jeremiah chapter 8. If you study the book of Jeremiah, this is a prophet who saw revival in the land of Israel. And in one generation, the nation went from having spiritual revival to being invaded by the Babylonians and being taken into captivity. In just one generation. One way you can be motivated to live a holy life is to understand what your sin does to your God. Jeremiah chapter 8, look with me in verse 18. We're going to read a few verses here and then we'll close. When I would comfort myself, this is God speaking through Jeremiah. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. This is God. In verse 19, behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended when we are not saved. Verse 21, for the hurt of the daughter of my people and my hurt. I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold of me. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is no, no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? God is watching his people steeped in sin. And he knows he, have to, he has to punish them. And he's sending the Babylonians to punish them. And now they're besieged by the Babylonians. And the children of Israel are suffering in the walls of Jerusalem. And God is looking down upon the suffering of his people. And he's saying, I am turning black. <laughs> With astonishment. When do you turn black? Have you ever had a black eye? Have ever somebody really hit you really hard? What happens? The bruise blue and black and and that's what was happening to God, he said. I was being bruised because I was watching me punish my own people because of their sin, and it grieved me in my heart and it hurt me. And I want to Read a couple of more verses from Jeremiah chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9 verse 1. And this is God speaking through Jeremiah. And this is God and he says, Oh that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. God was weeping and crying over his own people. Because they did not turn from their wicked way. Because he sent prophet after prophet after prophet. Some they killed, some they tortured. Jeremiah was tortured, beaten, thrown in a dungeon. One more verse. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 17. But if you will not hear it, hear what? The rebuke from the Lord regarding our sin. He says, My soul shall weep in secret places for your pride, and mine eye shall weep sore. And run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. Our sin hurts God so bad that he says he goes in a secret place and he weeps and he cries for us. And I think if you realize what your sin does to your God who loves you so much, I really believe you'll change. You'll try to change. Not through your own power, but through his power. Because he wants to give us the power to go and sin no more. And I'm convinced that what Jesus said to that woman, he's saying to us today, 2,000 years later, go and sin no more. And he doesn't mean just that woman, he means me and you. Because God weeps for our sin. It breaks his heart. And I pray that in 2019, as the year rolls around, that you will purpose in your heart and say, God, I know how much you love me. I know what you did for me on the cross. I know how much my sin hurts you. And Lord, I will try through the power that you give me, through the strength that you give me, to go and sin no more. Let's pray.